Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for joining us for the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. We are right here live on Facebook and on YouTube on tap today, a phenomenal show question though. Are you ready? to make the switch for good. Olympian Dotsie Bausch joins us to talk about how dairy is dragging down athletes and your health. Dotsie has such an incredible story and I cannot wait to catch up with her. Dotsie, thanks so much for joining us here on the exam room live stand by. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you really don't know Dotsie's story, I will tell you she is like the Rocky of Olympic cycling, just incredible. So we're gonna get into some science with her and that incredible story. And also on the show today, Dr. Jazz. Dr. Jasmine Sardana is here. She is here to answer your questions as we open up the doctor's mailbag. So if there is anything on your mind regarding health, nutrition, dairy, your diet, go ahead and post that in the comments section now. And we will be answering those questions a little bit later on in the show. Dr. Jazz, can't wait to catch up with you. Thanks, Jack. All right, but let's kick everything off by getting you caught up with what is happening in the world. Here are your health headlines for Thursday, July 9th, 2020. Indeed, we do start with the coronavirus as the battle against it rages more fiercely than ever. The U.S. topping 60,000 cases for the first time Wednesday, pushing the total number of cases to more than 3 million since the beginning of the pandemic. Some hospitals and especially hard hit areas such as Florida and Arizona are rushing to create additional intensive care beds and install new air filtration systems. Others are shuffling around doctors and nurses to assist at medical systems that have swelled to capacity. The rise in cases also bringing with it a rise in the number of deaths. Texas reporting a record number of COVID-19 patients died Wednesday, breaking the mark set just one day earlier. At least three other states also setting a grim record this week. More than a quarter of the 12 million confirmed cases worldwide are here in the U.S., where the death toll is now 132,000, according to Johns Hopkins. Meanwhile, COVID-19 has been mostly associated with difficulty breathing and fevers and cough, but there is growing evidence that the virus can also attack the body in a number of other ways. Researchers from the University of Liverpool say patients have also experienced strokes, confusion, and inflammation of the brain in areas where widespread outbreaks have been reported. The group is working to collect further data in hopes of fully understanding the issue. Their findings were published in the journal Lancet Neurology. In other news, a pair of new studies are providing further evidence that the more fruits and vegetables and whole grains you eat, the less likely you are to develop type 2 diabetes. Researchers in Europe used data from more than 13,000 adults to look at the connection between fresh produce consumption and your health, finding that for every 66 grams of fruits and veggies you eat, the risk of type 2 diabetes can fall by 25%. Put that in context, one apple or one orange will easily get you over that mark. For whole grains, researchers in the U.S. found those who ate just two or more servings of oatmeal every week lowered the risk of diabetes by more than 20%. Make that 15% for bran and 12% for brown rice. That is compared to those who ate only one serving per month. Overall, researchers say those who ate the most whole grains had a nearly 30% lower risk of diabetes. Thousands have signed a petition urging Kellogg's to begin using a plant-based version of vitamin D in their cereals. The breakfast food giant currently uses a version of vitamin D3 called lanolin that is derived from sheep's wool. The switch would immediately turn many otherwise non-vegan cereals into plant-based versions overnight, thus creating more options for breakfast in the morning. And finally, proving that real men don't need meat. A study published in the World Journal of Urology finds that men who eat a plant-based diet have just as much testosterone as their meat-eating counterparts. Nearly 200 men were tracked for this study. Harumph. <laughs> Moving on. From victory lane at the Indy 500 to the finish line of marathons across America to ads splashed across TV screens worldwide, milk has been touted as a cornerstone of a healthy diet necessary for strong teeth and bones and muscles that are all kinds of swole. We've been told that milk does a body good, but does it? Does it really? 
There is a growing course of elite athletes who say, we've got this all wrong, and they are ditching dairy to take their game and their health to the next level. Indeed, they are switching for good. Leading the charge is Olympian Dotsy Bosch, whose own story reads like a feel-good Disney movie. At an age when many cyclists are enjoying retirement, she was pedaling her way to an Olympic medal. With that, we welcome Dotsie to the exam room live. Dotsie, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thanks, weight loss champ. It's good to see you again. <laughs> it's great to see you too. How are things out in California? I know that there's this huge surge of cases, but you look like you're healthy and happy. So, so far, so good. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, we have a pretty strict governor, so we opened up oh, probably a good month after a lot of the Southern states. I'm from Kentucky and my family's there and, and, uh, and, and they opened up and then we, I was still waiting to get my nails done. Cause you know, we got to keep things <laughs> the important things in line here, but uh, yeah, I think it feels like it does anywhere. I think, you know, the thing that's just the scariest is how much we don't know about this virus. That's what freaks me out. You know, some people come down with the sniffles, some people die. Uh, some people get their limbs cut off, like that incredible uh, Broadway actor. Uh, some, you know, have uh, debilitating um, lung issues long term after. I mean, I just it's that's that's what I think is so freaky for for everyone. And, and so many doctors have varying opinions on what we should do. So, ugh, I yeah. don't know. I, yeah. I know, I know. But my wife, she does feel you with the nail with the nail thing. I mean, she was waiting for months to be able to get yeah. hers done. You should have seen the lengths <laughs> that she was going to to keep these things pieced together. It was, I know. It was really MacGyvering all 10 digits. It was just <laughs> remarkable. Um, let's. Uh, I want to talk uh, really quickly about your story for those who aren't familiar with you, because really you, you are kind of the Rudy of the cycling world. <laughs> you went vegan. <laughs> And your game just exploded all the way to a silver medal at the Olympics. Yes, it's true. I mean, it was a 13-year journey, and I, and I went plant-based a couple of years out of Olympic Games. I went to the 2012 Olympic Games. But it was pretty astounding. I, 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 I really entered uh, the plant-based vegan space through the ethical route. I mean, basically, I just had a moment where I thought, all of these animals that I grew up, like I said, I grew up in Kentucky and in the South and, and grew up on some land and just had every animal you could imagine. It was it was my play world. I, I was with them more than I was with humans. Uh, I would sleep with my horses at night. And I mean, and I just finally thought, what in the world? If I love animals so much, that probably is not going to include eating them. So it was just this awakening that I had almost overnight and changed my diet and really had no idea what was going to happen to my performance, my output, my strength. You know, I was a little concerned about my strength, uh, my events specifically uh, on track cycling starts from a standing start and track bikes are fixed gears, no brakes. So it is a is a massive load on the start to be able to get the bike up to speed. And so we have to have a really incredible amount of hip and glute and hamstring strength. And I didn't really know, you know, what this new diet was going to was going to do to me. I, I had I had no concept, but it was quickly uh, it quickly became kind of like my secret sword. Um, and, and like you said, I, I, I went to the Olympics uh, a little bit older than my teammates and competitors. I was 39 and a half uh, oldest still in, in my discipline um, to even go to the Olympic Games. And I really think that the diet had a huge impact on my repair, my recovery, even my strength gain, right? Being able to really have much better blood flow and getting that oxygen into the working muscles. I was able to, to, to grow you know, good, solid muscles that I needed for the start, but repair faster every day. Because as elite athletes, the most important thing is to be able to do the most workload because the athletes that's going to be able to do the most work is going to be stronger and better on race day. But you got to be able to repair between that work so that you can come back stronger. And that's the key to the plant based diet, right, is that repair and recovery uh, in between those hard days and those hard efforts. And that, you know, became the genesis for this incredible Switch for Good campaign, which you've been spearheading. And I look at this and all of the athletes who are saying, hey, we've taken dairy out of our diet. We're having similar success to what it is that you were just talking about. And then that kind of got me to thinking, well, why is it then that we're hearing 
uh, on the other side of the equation, people who say dairy is the reason why I'm finishing first. And we are seeing these ads that, you know, milk does a body good. And we're seeing people chug milk at the uh, victory lane of, of the Indy 500. What is, you know, yeah. <laughs> where does that come from beyond just slick marketing? Yeah, chuck, chucking, chugging breast milk at the end of a race. It's just like, what's <laughs> happening right now? I know. We do have to look always uh, at who is profiting behind the messages that we're receiving in the general public. And milk spent $90 million last year on those types of campaigns. So <laughs> they got some deep pockets. We don't have quite that budget at Switch for Good. <laughs> we're, we're getting there. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really, I think, making sure that you're digging deeper and asking more questions about what you're being fed. Uh, we've been fed this um, this false narrative since we were little tiny, right? That the milk mustache and milk does a body good and and, and it's, it's, it's all the marketing behind that. Uh, we don't have the studies to stand up that truth. And milk tends to just kind of, um, you know, rest on their laurels that milk has nutrients. I hope so. It's breast milk for a growing baby calf, right? So of course it has nutrients in it, but it also has an onslaught of other elements that make us humans uh, very sick. A, a lot of, um, you know, there are molecules in milk that our body doesn't recognize. Um, the sugar molecule in eu 5 gc um, D-galactose is also in studies been, been shown to really create inflammation in our bodies because our body does not recognize that form of it from cow's milk. And so what happens when we don't, our body doesn't recognize something, it creates a defense mechanism, right? And that always in, internally comes in the form of inflammation and you guys know better than anyone that inflammation is really the precipitous and the beginning of, of some of our most common diseases and our biggest killers that we have here in the US. So we can get all of those nutrients from other foods. It is, the, you know, vitamin D, which is fortified anyway in milk, but you can get vitamin D from having a little sunshine or, you know, you can supplement with it. Of calcium, of course, you can get from all the amazing plant world, dark leafy greens, almonds, tahinis, the highest sesame seeds, right? So dip your chips or your carrots into tahini. I'm always telling parents they're so worried about the calcium if they take their, their, their child off of cow's milk. Um, but kids love, uh, you know, dipping anything. So dip in tahini, um, you know, the magnesium, the potassium, it's all, it's all found in, uh, in mother earth food. So just eat real food and you'll get all the nutrients that you need to recover and repair. You mentioned inflammation kind of being the precipitous for all of these chronic diseases. A lot of them are among the leading killers here in the States and, and worldwide. On our sister show, The Exam Room podcast earlier this week, I did an episode called Debating Dairy. And my guest mm. on that episode was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Gary Frazier, very famous epidemiologist. Matter of fact, he's speaking at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine next month. Right. I asked him, I said, well, should dairy belong in the same category as processed meat and as tobacco? And he said, no. He said, although I'm trending away from dairy, mm -hmm. I'm not yet ready to put it in the same category. Mm -hmm. Are you though, Dotsie, ready to put it there? Well, I certainly wouldn't argue, you know, what, what he's saying from a, you know, a scientific standpoint. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly speaking about it in, in terms of, inflammatory responses that we are seeing and experiencing as athletes from eating animal-based foods, right? So that, you know, is the onslaught of all of them. And uh, dairy for most people uh, is, they, they have an intolerance to it. 65% of the world's population cannot properly digest cow's milk. So that's a big argument right there to drop it. Because if you are one of those people, some of the side effects are exacerbating asthma symptoms, difficulty breathing, uh, dry cough, stuffy nose, bloating, constipation, diarrhea. I mean, really pretty nasty, nasty symptoms. So it's just kind of looking at, well, what foods am I putting in my body that are making me better? And what foods am I putting in my body that are making me worse? And Cow's milk is definitely a detriment uh, to the athlete system, and 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 certainly we could we could certainly put it behind processed meats. I mean that's fine with me, but it's it's you know it's a hard second right there. And if you have any issues digesting milk, or you feel kind of that chronic um, 
lethargy or, or, or just tiredness. I, we hear all the time from people that when they get dairy out of their diet, their energy comes back. And that again is probably from either part intolerance or part of that inflammatory response. So, you know, we're looking at being our best version of ourselves, not just like mediocre. So that's my argument for ditching dairy. <laughs> Uh, and it's a, it's a pretty strong one at that. You said 65%. That's that's roughly two thirds. And so when you have that many people who are having issues there, that kind of makes you think about the upcoming dietary guidelines that are being reformulated. They're supposed to come out early next year. And I'm yeah. kind of wondering, well, where is dairy going to stand in those guidelines? We've seen other countries such as Canada really take a big step yeah. back from dairy. What do you think is going to happen here in the States? Yeah. So in the States, it's 36% of Americans are lactose intolerant. So that again, that's a third of us. That's about 120 million Americans that this food group just makes sick, sick simply because of, of the intolerance to it. So um, we've definitely been waging a fight specifically to the dietary guidelines, the Center for Nutrition Policy, the USDA, in as it relates to lactose intolerant. Obviously there's lots of health ill effects of milk, but as it relates to lactose intolerant, it is an inarguable situation because the numbers come, to, the, the intolerant numbers, um, 120 million Americans come directly from the NIH. And they are numbers that the dietary guidelines references. So if you have a food group, right, on the guidelines that makes a third of the American population sick, and disproportionately makes people of color sick, that is a serious form of dietary racism, right? Uh, and so we have we are pushing to get dairy removed at, as it specifically relates to that. Did a huge campaign in the public commentary and set you know time frame that we could you know give public commentary. And we ended up uh, being responsible for 27% of all total comments, which is setting us up um, let me just say for a fight that we'll be dealing with. I was on the phone with your amazing Susan Levin yesterday, yeah, figuring out our little, <laughs> our little plans. So it's it's a it's a it's a big big problem, and they don't have education around it on the dietary guidelines. You know, it's like there's this one sentence that says, "If you think you have lactose malabsorption, you can have soy milk." But the biggest problem really is with our children and this and the checkoff program, the school lunch program, because they don't have alternatives at public schools, zero. So if, mm -hmm. if a, you know, a third of these children, they're taking a milk and it's making them sick, they don't even know what's wrong. They don't know why they feel that way. They don't know why they feel bloated and gassy. We get emails all the time from children at Switch for Good. Can you help me? My mom thinks I should have whole fat cow's milk in my cereal. A 15 year old wrote us a, a, a bit ago. Um, and I want her to know that, it, you know, I can get nutrients from other milks and I go to school and she said, um, and I'm embarrassed. And to me, that means she's probably, you know, bloated and gassy. And and it's, it's it, 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 we have to have education around this. I'm not, delusional that they're going to rip dairy off this time around. I have a lot of hopes in five years from now with the work that we're all doing, but they at least need to provide a significant amount of education and there needs to be an alternative in schools for children to cow's milk. I would agree 100%. And it's the thing is, I think back about, gosh, the, almost 30 years ago to when I was in elementary school. And I remember going to school with a friend who he had a, a tick you know, he couldn't stop nodding his head and nobody could figure out for years what this was until finally the doctor all those years ago was like, this is a reaction to dairy. And as soon wow. as they took that out of his diet, the tick was gone. The same thing that, you know, he was getting picked on and teased because of mm -hmm. was simply gone overnight. And he went on to lead a happy and healthy life that was absolutely 100% tick free. And so Gosh. this connection really isn't, all that new, it just kind of yeah, makes no. you realize that, man, you know, we're really up against some powerful lobbyists here and, and Dairy Management Inc., which of course sounds a little bit conspiracy theorist. But if you go and, and you look yeah. at the FOIA yeah. requests that we filed and all of the, the records yeah. that we have, I mean, it's just amazing how much pressure is being put on from on high to get as much dairy into schools and into restaurants, fast food restaurants everywhere yeah. as possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a giant. It's a it's a David and Goliath story for sure. You know, it makes you think back to the tobacco days. And we we, we will get there. 
We Amen will. to that. Amen yeah. to that. And I think that your Switch for Good campaign is going to be a big part of that as well. Uh, you guys are everywhere at the moment. I know that uh, one of our colleagues here at the Physicians Committee had his mom text recently this week. It was like, hey, I just saw a, a PSA on the Today Show for this campaign called Switch for Good. Have you heard about it? So you guys are all over the place. What are you up to? Yeah, so we, well, like we started the show out kind of talking about the virus. We had a huge, you know, education brand awareness plan leading into the Olympics, right? It's supposed to launch mid-April and we had, we were, I was going to be in Tokyo. We had all this stuff set up and then boom, <laughs> no more Olympics. So we said, listen, we still really believe in making sure that we get this part of the message out this year. So the campaign to me, uh, I mean, Switch for Good itself is a nonprofit organization, but this this is uh, this is a, our summer campaign that we call "Listen to Your Gut and Switch for Good." Uh, so it's really about people learning to truly listen to uh, the experience that they're having eating different foods, right? And listen to your gut. And if your gut is telling you that dairy is making you feel terrible uh, or bloated or asthmatic, or you know, give it a try. Just ditch it for some days, and 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 you'll know you'll know the difference. So we ended up launching. Uh, the campaign on NBC Monday, like a couple days ago. So it's running on NBC for a couple of months every day on the Today Show. It's also running uh, on multiple streaming platforms. And we also have um, a radio buy, which is a little different than the PSAs themselves. They're, they're interviews and, and different uh, scripts with the various DJs around the country who are uh, dairy free. So we got to have some really deep, rich conversations with with these DJs and on their journeys and their experiences with uh, with ditching dairy. So, and we have a big um, official scientific review report that's launching at the beginning of August. It's really the first of its kind that that looks at the history of of milk's marketing uh, into the athlete space and uh, goes into depth um, into great depth and understanding the ill effects on health and performance uh, on athletes. It's written by six MDs and two dietitians. So we're really excited for that to come out too in the, in the beginning of August. That's awesome. I, I can guarantee that was the first time the term radio buy has been mentioned on this show. That just melts my little media heart. So God bless you for that. Uh, yeah. So here's the deal. If you want to learn more about this campaign, head over to switch the number four good.org or check out your podcast. You're a podcaster now as well. The switch for good podcast. You and I were emailing a little bit before the show. You're telling me that thing is just blowing up right now. Yeah. We've seen some really good growth month over month. We're, we're, we're at, a, we're just about a year in and, I hosted alongside Alexandra Paul, who so many of you know, longtime animal activist, um, uh, most notably known in her acting career for being on Baywatch for all those years in the, the red bathing suit, which was, I don't know how she pulled that off. And said, oh my gosh, stressful. But we have just the most extraordinary time together. And we're just, you know, we're, we're just like you, right? You just continue to uh, improve every single time. You know, we're pushing ourselves to be better, do better, and make sure that we're getting the information that the audience wants, right? Really helping people understand, be educated and, and help them on their journey, hold their hand along the way. So we've had some, we've had some great guests on and yeah, we're just hammering away. So if you, if you want to lean into to listening to that, we're, we're there on all the podcatchers. Thanks for bringing it up. That's kind of you. Of course, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever shows yeah. are available, that's where you can look for it. Switch for good. Also on Instagram at switch the number four good. Dotsie Bosch, you are just a true joy and a delight. Thank you so oh. much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'll talk to you soon. This was fun. All righty. Take okay. care. Cheers. All right. Time now to open up the doctor's mailbag. Dr. Jazz has been kindly waiting in the wings to answer your nutrition, diet, health-related questions. So if you have one, go ahead and post that in the comments section now. And as those comments start to uh, trickle in. I also want to bring in Dr. Jazz. Dr. Jazz, before we dive into the mailbag, I want to follow up on what it was that Dotsie and I were just talking about. From a doctor's standpoint, just in layman's terms, how critical is it that your patients get dairy out of their diet? Um, on a scale from one to 10, probably zero. <laughs> it's it's um, not important for me that my patients uh, get dairy in their diet at all. Because if we really think about the reasons why dairy is recommended, you know, what's the top reason? Calcium, right? For bone health. Um, and as Dotsie mentioned, 
so many of our the world's population, so many of my patients are lactose intolerant. So if you're lactose intolerant and you're not able to tolerate milk products because it gives you gas, it gives you bloating, it makes you feel horrible, you know, how, and, and I know that there are alternatives, healthier alternatives to getting your calcium, um, then why wouldn't I recommend that? You know, also if you're lactose intolerant and the only messaging that you receive is that calcium is only found in milk and in order to get calcium, you have to eat milk. Uh, I think that's a really skewed, narrow and unfair recommendation to make. And if you think that, you're probably not gonna get as much calcium consistently as you should because you're gonna be struggling to try to find either pills to be able to digest the dairy products. You're gonna try to find the lactose-free milk um, and what I tell my patients is you don't need it in your diet. There are wonderful alternatives to it. Um, so no, I, I don't think they, it's needed in my patient's diet. And, and so often is somebody will say that, Hey, I would go vegan. I'm vegetarian, but I would go vegan except for the cheese. The cheese is the hardest part. What, what advice, what suggestions do you have for somebody who's really kind of a cheeseaholic? Yeah. So that was me. I had cheese for breakfast. I had cheese as a like mid morning snack and I had cheese at lunch and I had cheese at, you know, at dinner and I had cheese uh, with maybe a glass of wine later in the evening. So I, that was me. That was me. Definitely. Um, my skin suffered for it. My weight suffered for it. Um, and it just all it, cheese is addicting. There are opioid like you know, um, elements within cheese that keeps us addicted to it. So when people say I'm addicted to cheese and I can't get off of it, I believe them because I was there. The advice that I have for you, um, this is going to, this is part of how I practice with my patients. It's not just about me telling you what to do and what to cut out. I can do that. That's part of the, the beauty of having this podcast and having Barnard Medical Center and PCRM do the wonderful work that we do is to get that message out there. But when it comes to your personal health, the best advice I have for you is figuring out why you are even considering a change. What is it? What issue? What problem are you having that you're considering? Oh, okay. I do really want to go vegan, but I can't because I can't get rid of the cheese. Well, what is that underlying reason? That's my number one. Once you figure out exactly why or what benefit you're looking for, making that step to cut cheese out of your diet becomes a lot easier. For me, it was my personal health. It was my family genetics that were going to set me up for a heart attack by the age of 50, um, obesity, hypertension, diabetes. And I saw those things in my future kind of waiting for me, waiting to trap me. Uh, and I knew that unless I made some changes that that wasn't going to happen. So because I got in touch with my why, my underlying reason for why I wanted to be healthy, uh, then that change became easier. And the second piece of advice is do it. Like once you try not eating cheese or finding other alternatives, um, it gets easier. It gets easier. Let's open up that doctor's mailbag now and start fielding some questions here. First of all, we'll start with a comment from Blue uh, who wrote, I was lacto-vegetarian for 45 years, dropped dairy six years ago, and my digestion went from being okay to being perfect. That is phenomenal. That's the kind of results that we like to hear. Here's the first question. comes to us from Andrea at 1208. Does milk cause osteoporosis? My 58-year-old aunt has it, but she won't stop drinking milk. Yeah, so that's that's right. So good question. Bone health has been a big reason why dairy has been pushed um, among children um, and even in the older population for bone health. You know, and when I've looked at the data and when you look at what's truly out there, the data is completely inconsistent. Um, it's very weak at best to show that dairy can prevent osteoporosis or fractures. And in fact, there is some literature, I'll have to find the details because I don't remember it off the top of my head, that dairy consumption can actually um, put you at risk of developing osteoporosis. So the opposite, the thing that you're actually trying to prevent, it can actually be linked to causing. Um, and again, if, it, if bone health is the reason why you're eating dairy or consuming dairy, um, there are better alternatives. There are plant-based alternatives that you can choose and, and encourage your uh, family member to choose. As Dotsie mentioned, dark green leafy vegetables. So Chuck, if, you if I gave you a cup of milk and a cup of uh, collards, collard greens, 
which of those would you say has the most amount of calcium? I mean, is this really even a question, Dr. Jazz? <laughs> I mean, come on now. First of all, I would choose the collard greens all day because I'm from Southern Virginia. Second of all, that's yes. the answer anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of a trick question, sorry. But it's the same. It's the oh, same. It? It's okay. exactly the same. Um, and so when people tell me that calcium um, is only found in milk and like it's such a great source of it, I mean, cup for cup, you know, this, it's exactly the same. So it doesn't really make sense to me. Um, and in fact, tofu, four ounces of tofu that Dotsie was snacking on. Um, ha so our, reg our daily requirement of calcium is about a thousand milligrams a day. Four ounces of tofu has 1100 milligrams. So you're meeting that and then going beyond. Um, so encourage your family member to try other sources. Tofu is wonderful. Um, and she doesn't need dairy. All right. Question from Melissa at 1229. How can I build my homemade meals to be balanced and meet nutritional requirements? Planning and talking to your family. So if you are, um, if you live alone, that's fine. And you're only cooking for yourself. That's fine. You really just kind of, you still want to plan ahead. Um, and I think that's the, so for myself as a plant-based physician, as a plant-based mom, it's really important for me that my kids meet all of their nutrient requirements. That's one thing I absolutely, you know, am concerned about. But if I plan their meal and I plan it not by, oh, okay, this is a, you know, um, I don't know, a vegetable, a carrot. It has, you know, this percentage, it doesn't have to be that way. I go by looks. So if I'm eating the rainbow, if I'm making sure that my child, my, our family is eating uh, all of the rainbow, a few times, a couple times a day, then I know that all of those nutrients, all of those important nutrients are being met. All right. Final question comes to us from Ron at 1228. Ah, this is one that's going to speak to the heart of almost everyone. Chocolate. I am very thin, but eating 4.4 .4 ounces, very specific, 4.4 .4 ounces of 85% dark chocolate. Is that bad for me? I specifically am looking at the saturated fat of 35 grams. Oh my goodness. Ooh. Thank you. So what do you say to that, Dr. Jazz? I think you know the answer <laughs> that, I mean, just the fact that you have the amount of saturated fat um, that you mentioned, that's way too much. That's way too much. I think there are better alternatives. And if you wanted to cut back on maybe the amount and the frequency with which you're enjoying your chocolate, um, um, that might be a better alternative, but that amount of saturated fat, and that's another important piece about dairy, right? So things like chocolate, specifically milk chocolate and other forms of chocolate that have more dairy in it, uh, the concern there you know, we've talked about bone health for to a degree, but heart health, that, that amount of saturated fat, your body's not going to like that. Your heart's not going to be happy with that. Um, so if you're noticing that large amount of saturated fat in 4.4 ounces of dark chocolate, I would definitely recommend to look for a different product or decrease the amount of frequency. Indeed. And you know what? This other one, it caught my eye. It speaks to the heart of what it is that we've been talking about here today. Interesting. I had not uh, Edith at 1234 says, I've heard that not drinking milk as a child results in shorter height. Is that true? Have you heard anything like that? I, you know, I don't know the data behind that, but I know that that's a concern. And I think it tugs at the hearts of moms everywhere because that's the worst thing, right? You, you, you don't want to inadvertently harm your child in any way. I personally don't know of any data right now that, that shows that to be true. I can certainly look <clears throat> and come back to you with those answers. Um, but right now, I, I don't, I don't know of that data. Um, but I imagine I, I but Chuck, again, I'm going to come back to this. <clears throat> I know lots of plant based moms, I know lots of plant based families who are thriving, who are growing, who are doing remarkably well. And also, you want to consider with these questions and, and what you're and what we're talking about to put it in a bit of context, what does shorter mean? What's shorter? An inch shorter, two inches shorter, a foot shorter. So what is that takeaway? And what's that balance? So if you're like, even if your child happens to be, let's just say, I'm not saying this is for fact, but if your child ends up being maybe a half inch shorter, is that okay for not having exposed them to dairy for the rest of their, you know, during their childhood years? Um, for me, that would probably be a yes. I think it's a personal question for all families to consider. But um, I'll look into some of that data for you.
Yeah, and let me just say this. I ate a ton of dairy, drank a ton of milk as a child, <laughs> and I'm 5'5", five five, okay? So let's let's also keep that into perspective. There is the True. other side of the coin that True. says dairy isn't going to make you a six-footer either. Uh, all right, so here here's uh, the final question is, where can I find a good plant-based doctor such as Dr. Jazz? And the answer, Dr. Jazz, is right where you are at the Barnard That's Medical right. Center. Matter of fact, this is uh, your your first day back in the office. That's uh, kind of a vacation. It is. We're so excited to be able to be available to our patients for in-person visits. We're uh, doing annual physical exams um, because people are coming up on, you know, having to take care of their routine medical um, uh, necessities. So we're definitely open for that now. And still doing your telemedicine visits via barnardmedical.org, right? Yes, we're we're continually offering telemedicine visits. In fact, we're um, you know, week by week, we're expanding our licensure across several states. So uh, we'd love to see you either via telehealth or in person if you're in the area. Yeah, and you see that website right there, barnardmedical.org, and the phone number 202-527-7500. And those states that Dr. Jess was referencing, let's run down the list real quick. California, New York, Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, Kentucky, and the District of Columbia, the nation's capital. Any one of those locations, you can see one of the doctors or dietitians at BMC today. So log on to barnardmedical.org or pick up that phone, 202-527-7500. And as Dr. Sardana said, new states coming online, hopefully very, very soon. All right, Dr. Jess, thank you so much for your time. We'll catch up again with you soon. Thanks so much, Chuck. This is great. All right. And also out today is a brand new episode of the Exam Room Podcast. And this features, uh, we revisit the conversation that we had on yesterday's Exam Room Live, where I sat down with the Lajani family led by Josh Lajani, you know, the, the marathoner, the marathon man who went from 420 pounds to the cover of Runner's World magazine. Well, it turns out that Josh isn't the only plant-based inspiration in his family. He was the first. And then everybody else became inspired. And they go plant-based. Everybody goes vegan. And what happens? The family loses more than 1,000 pounds. And so we have their story on the Exam Room Podcast. You can check that out right now over on Apple Podcast or Spotify, Stitcher, wherever the finest shows are available. Hit that subscribe button and please also leave a five-star rating. Esteemed cardiologist Dr. Baxter Montgomery is also on the show and it is just a phenomenal one. So check that out today. Exam Room Podcast over on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or Stitcher. On the show here tomorrow, the live show, Dr. Neil Barnard will be back to talk about to supplement or not to supplement. That is the question many vegans are wondering. So Dr. Barnard will be here with some guidance on that. We're also going to be looking at alcohol. A lot of people say, well, hey, red wine in particular, there's a lot of health benefits that come with that. But do those benefits outweigh the risk? We're going to weigh that with Dr. Barnard as well. And Dr. Jim Loomis, medical director from the Barnard Medical Center and the documentary, The Game Changers. He will be on the show tomorrow as well to answer more of your questions when he and Dr. Barnard team up to open the doctor's mailbag. So be sure to tune in right back here on Facebook and on YouTube at noon Eastern. We would love to see you then. But for today... That is all the time that we have. My thanks to our producer, Laura Anderson, and our director, Donna Steele. And on behalf of Dotsie Bash and, and Dr. Jazz and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for joining us today. And until tomorrow, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based. <laughs>